So I'm Becca Hudson, I'm your host for today, and I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit um, so that it's clear why I might be here. Um, so I'm a researcher um, and I look at the most prevalent psychiatric diagnosis in British prisons, which are personality disorders. Um, so personality disorders, there are a number of different types of personality disorder, um, which I will call PD for short from now on. Um, and PD is thought to be prevalent in around 4 to 13 percent of the wider population in the UK. Uh, but this skyrockets in prison. So some estimations have up to 80 percent of the UK prison population with some form of personality disorder. And even conservative estimates put it at around 60 percent. Um, I can't go into much detail about how you get diagnosed um, or kind of what, what PD itself is, um, but we're now in a situation in kind of contemporary UK prison system where PD is something that is screened for a person who comes into prison at their induction into that prison. Um, there's a checklist that looks at their kind of past behaviour, their history of offences, um, and makes all sorts of quite subjective things, so around whether they... Uh, carry out a predatory lifestyle, um, assessments of their remorse for their crimes, um, which are of course quite kind of uh, subjective and, and often problematic sorts, sort of assessments. This level of like widespread screening for PD um, was really instituted in the early 2000s um, after a particular case where um, uh, a man murdered a mother um, and, her, and her daughter and he was later found to have an untreated, even though it was known to mental health practitioners, an untreated personality disorder. Um, and this was kind of huge news at the time um, and motivated uh, an expansion of mental health practitioners working with criminal justice institutions in order to screen people for this kind of dangerous disorder um, and a risk which was inherent to individuals who held this disorder um, to pre-criminalise them essentially, so to look at whether they were uh, had the potential to commit a heinous crime um, or cause a great deal of harm um, even before they had done anything. And they tried to sort of recruit mental health workers into this work. Uh, in some ways they succeeded, in other ways uh, they failed. Um, if you have a personality disorder in, in prison, if you have carry that diagnosis with you, um, it's a very double-edged sword. So having a PD diagnosis and, and kind of coming into contact with the existing the pathways and institutions that exist and were created in the early 2000s to manage people with PD, it is often one of the few ways that you might be able to access uh, mental health support. And it is often one of the few diagnoses where there is some conception that you have experienced trauma, which may have motivated your offending behaviour. Um, and most mental health interventions in prison are focused around why did this person commit this particular offence and therefore how does their kind of uh, psychiatric state help us to explain and re rehabilitate them. I'm using the language of these institutions, I'm not necessarily agreeing with it. Um, but it is a double-edged sword in that being diagnosed with PD also comes with this uh, conception of risk. So at things like parole hearings and any kind of decisions around release and giving an individual any form of uh, more freedom, a PD diagnosis can work against somebody. Um, so it, as it's seen as a form of kind of inherent risk that is inside the person and pursues them through different prisons and criminal justice inst institutions, um, it can also be that even though you may get access to some form of mental health support, you may be in uh, prison or other kinds of carceral institutions for much longer. So what has any of this got to do with imperial history? Um, so the development of British psychiatry, even though it is kind of not perhaps looked at um, as much as French psychiatry, which Frantz Fanon famously writes about the uh, operation of French psychiatry, um, British colonial psychiatrists also have this history. Um, the colonial psychiatrists of the British Empire were not considered as influential as in France, uh, but you would meet a British colonial psychiatrist if you were in a British colony, um, and you would really only meet them once you were in prison. So if there was some transgression of the colonial order and you ended up uh, in a colonial prison, this would be the context in which you would uh, come into contact with a colonial psychiatrist. 
Um, there's lots of examples of this. There's some kind of like really rich historical work which is done on this uh, in Jamaica, in Kenya, um, and also in Bengal and present-day Bangladesh, and the way in which British like colonial cultures were working there. Um, they look not only at the kind of strategies of confinement that happen in those prisons, um, but also the way in which often when people were organizing uh, against empire, the assessments of those people when they were put into uh, colonial prisons and assessed by these psychiatrists, um, these kind of psychiatric assessments were not just about the confining of those individuals, but often went forward into kind of white papers that went to the British government um, that helped them think about and strategize into how to quell dissent and to enforce colonial order in places uh, where people were was in trouble. Um, and if you take these, these kind of white papers, these documents together, uh, they problematize the psyche of colonized populations um, and they create uh, a taxonomy of different type, different psyches, uh, the Arab mind, the East African mind, and so on. And so on. Uh, these pathologies were used as explanations for these people's defiance for the imperial order, um, oftentimes their aggression or their impulsiveness. Um, and following on from this, the necessity then of restraint, the risk of releasing them, the risk of letting these people do um, what they wanted to do. So in this way, the development of psychiatric diagnoses themselves not only took place during a period uh, at the height of the British Empire, uh, but psychiatry itself was developed, tested and enforced as part of the colonizing project. And it was done in a way which was deeply tied up to the development of forms of colonial confinement, imprisonment and the control of populations um, and went into knowledge production at the behest of the British state directly. Um, these, th these themes are very much with us today uh, and they form the context in which much abolitionist organising happens. So as well as the kind of uh, personality disorder problem which I've outlined in terms of conceptions of risk and how this goes on to affect people's ability to be free and also to access support, um, one really important area uh, that's kind of increasingly happening and, and very crucial is the way in which national security and mental health are overlapping. And this is really prevalent in pre-criminalizing orders and surveillance, particularly around serious youth violence um, and also in the prevent duty. Um, I'd really encourage everyone here to look at a recent article by Tarek Yunus called The Psychologization of Counter-Extremism. And that looks at the way in which psychological language around risk and disorder have become not only racialized explanations of people's behavior as they were in this imperial history, but also a euphemism through which carceral institutions can avoid talking about race and, avoid, and evade the charge of racism. Um, so I would really encourage everybody to look at that article and think about the way in which um, this affects not only individuals, people's lives, um, but as Tarek Nunes outlines in this article, the way in which protests and dissent in particular are becoming psychologized and criminalized through this kind of pre-criminal work. Okay, that is all for me. And so I would now like to invite our next speaker, Nadine, to please give your introduction. Thank you so much. Um, um... Becca, that was really fascinating to hear about your research. Um, that um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to reading the article you recommended, and of course, and of course, reading your work. Um, and thank you very much to the organisers for um, inviting me to speak. So I'm, I'm going to speak a bit about the research I did um, for my book and try to relate it a bit to the um, uh, uh, theme of empire and abolition um, today. So I think that the first thing to say. Um, when we're thinking about empire and abolition in the context of law, in particular immigration law, is that the UK's immigration law policy, it's not only shaped by British colonialism, which is often the way that it's talked about, it is itself an extension of colonialism. Um, so it is itself colonial violence. So the law in this context is colonial violence. And I'll, I'll try and say a bit about what I mean by this. And to do that, I need to get into the law a little bit. Um, so ju just bear, bear with me for, for, for this for this. Um, beginning part of the of, of, of the talk. So 
as the British Empire was defeated, um, successive British governments introduced immigration controls, um, which withdrew the rights of racialized Commonwealth citizens and British colonial subjects. Um, and, and they did this by introducing um, a legal concept, which, which was made up, it, it didn't exist um, before the 1971 Immigration Act, but it was called patriality. And this concept basically said that only those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain had a right of entry and stay. And what this did is it made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. So racial exclusion was in this way written into the law um, through this concept of patriality. Um, so in 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. Um, so clearly the design of this law was to achieve racial exclusion and it was um, successful in preventing the vast majority of racialized colonial and former colonial subjects from traveling to and settling in Britain. And then we have the 1981 British Nationality Act, which continued this process of racial exclusion because it built the concept of British citizenship on the foundation of that concept of patriality that was introduced in the 1971 Act. So in this way, citizenship was tied to the right of entry and abode, um, which itself was tied to whiteness. Um, and so what happened was this raised for the first time the idea of a post-imperial territorially defined Britain. And it severed a notionally white, geographically distinct Britain for the first time from the remainder of its colonies and the Commonwealth. And the Home Secretary at the time, um, William Whitelaw, said that the idea behind the 1981 Act was to send a message to all those who, um, who in, who's, in countries that we used to rule, um, that they do not belong in Britain. Um, so the 1981 Act didn't signify an end to British colonialism. It was itself a colonial mover, maneuver. So that's what I meant um, at the beginning when I said that law itself is colonial violence. So, so the Act, um, through the effect that it had, was an act of appropriation, a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure that was secured through centuries of colonial conquest. And of course, the effect of the Act, along with the changes to immigration law that I mentioned, um, was to put the wealth of Britain um, out of reach, which of course gained by colonial conquest, out of the reach of the vast majority of racialized people, most of whom have um, geographical or ancestral histories of British colonialism. So when we're thinking about what abolition might look like in the context of the border regime, the British border regime as embedded as it is um, in Britain's colonial history and indeed as an expression of its colonial history, um, I find it sometimes helpful to think about what abolition wouldn't be in that context, or maybe just think, um, kind of give our minds time to think a bit about what the specific challenges are um, to an abolitionist approach in the context of immigration law and enforcement, which might seem um, a bit more complicated um, than say in a context um, of, of, of policing, for instance. Um, and I'll try to get into that um, get into that um, a bit now. So I think one of the major challenges to um, any kind of abolitionist practice or really abolitionist practice um, when we're thinking about immigration law is because law plays this dual role. Um, the law isn't only the thing that obstructs movement, so prevents people from being able to um, uh, take back what is rightfully theirs. So if we think about um, British immigration law as being um, um, uh, withholding um, resources that, that rightfully belong elsewhere. Um, it doesn't only obstruct movement, it's also the way in which legal status is granted. So it's the only way, it's the only game in town for so-called inclusion. So, um, you know, the whole, uh, uh, the, the immigration law regime is, is built um, in the form of these regimes of legal status recognition, whereby British authorities say whether or not an individual is entitled to statuses such as citizenship or settlement or refugee status or indefinitely to remain. Um, and, and in that way, um, these statuses and, and indeed the power that lies with British authorities to determine who gets the status and who doesn't, um, actually serves to legitimize that claim that colonial wealth, as it manifests in Britain, belongs behind its borders, and it's only to be accessed with permission by the colonial state. So by kind of dealing with the colonial state in, the, you know, applying for these statuses and seeking these statuses, and indeed, you know, lawyers working in the everyday important work, of course, of making the claim that people deserve these statuses and fulfill the criteria, you are yourself ensnared within the very, um, 
um, violence um, of that border regime. And of course, legal practitioners know this better than anybody else. They work within the system daily. Um, they they are more aware than anybody else um, uh, about that the violence of the system um, in the way that they work within it. And of course. Um, the only group of people more aware are the people affected by um, the violence of the regime. So, so in a way, this facade of racial inclusion has been built in the form of paths to legal status recognition, which dole out immigration statuses to select racialized people who can, can fulfill certain criteria. And of course, that recognition is always on the terms of the colonial state. Um, and of course, meanwhile, the vast majority of people are prevented from um, accessing um, Britain. So if we want to maybe use an example of how people, um, how, uh, you know, well-meaning arguments or sort of well-meaning um, uh, ap approaches might fall outside of being abolitionist approaches precisely because of this tension in law of being both um, what obstructs movement, but also what you need to appeal to to get rights. Um, uh, we can maybe look at the Windrush scandal as a, as a recent sort of example. Um, so, you know, we, we saw the Windrush scandal um, uh, provoke uh, uh, an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented outcry. Um, but, what, but, but one of the problems um, in how um, some activists and scholars kind of responded to the Windrush scandal was, was actually through making arguments that were frequently framed in terms of actually served to kind of further this uh, politics of recognition, which is not in line with, with abolitionist goals, because of course it requires you to, to, to participate in the system, to ask for um, permission um, and to ask for, for being um, welcomed into a status. Um, um, and sort of recognizes uh, British, white British people as being the sort of rightful um, holders of British uh, uh, citizenship and everybody else is sort of a guest and gets it according to whether or not they're deemed civilized enough by meeting the criteria of these statuses. Um, and so one of the arguments that was made during the Windrush scandal is that the Windrush generation were citizens. Um, and this was a claim that was made um, by uh, by several scholars and activists. And of course, it does fulfill an immediate sort of strategic purpose and in individual legal um, cases to make this argument. But it also has the effect of legitimizing um, the colonial British state's immigration regime, not only because it cedes um, the power of recognition, but it also um, kind of avoids the reality um, that um, racialized British subjects who tra traveled to Britain after the passing of the legislation that I that I mentioned earlier were not actually welcomed by the British government. That was entirely mythological. So to say, oh, these are good British citizens that we that welcomed and rebuilt the country, um, and now um, we're treating them suddenly um, badly um, is actually completely untrue. Post-war labor gaps were filled primarily um, by facilitating white European labor. And the arrival of, 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 of the Windrush generation actually came as a shock to the British government, which spent decades discouraging racialized colony and Commonwealth citizens from traveling to Britain and, and did this um, for a while, not by passing legislation, but just by putting pressure, significant pressure on colony and Commonwealth governments um, to stop the movement at its source. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that history um, um, because otherwise you're erasing empire um, completely from our understanding of the way in which um, Britain remains racially and colonially configured today. So these kinds of recognition um, based arguments for migrant solidarity, um, not so they, they serve to, to sort of um, reinforce the mythological narrative um, on Britain's colonial history. Um, and it also enables the hostile environment's effect on the Windrush generation and their descendants to be presented as an aberration rather than as part of a continuum of colonial violence, which of course we can see um, very clearly in the fabric of everyday life um, in Britain for the vast majority of racialized people. And of course, those outside Britain. Um, so presenting um, uh, the racist state violence that the Windrush generation experienced as exceptional serves to preclude the adoption of broader um, anti-racist um, abolitionist um, goals. And it and, and and when actually we can see the way in which, um, you know, uh, the violence that the Windrush generation experienced wasn't in any way an aberration. If we, we only have to look at what happened um, with the Grenfell Tower fire, um, and Britain's imperialist wars abroad, um, which are masked, of course, in the language of humanitarian intervention. We we only need to look at uh, international trade trade rules, and their and their impact um, 
as well. So, so that's one of the problems is appealing to citizenship rights as a means of challenging racial state violence um, actually serves to prevent um, the adoption of abolitionist and broader anti-racist strategies. Um, so we can see that operating, for example, when we look at um, um, the way in which um, so-called foreign criminals are, are, are treated. Um, so while law-abiding members of the Windrush generation might be saved from racial exclusion because they can be constructed as the good, the good immigrant, the good citizen, um, that's not the case for those who fall outside that 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 discourse and that language that is that is um, that is taken up um, by organisations, activists, lawyers, etc. So, um, you know, it, it's the idea that legal status recognition processes definitively determine entitlement to be in Britain that allowed then Home Secretary Sajid Javid to defend a child for deportation flight to Jamaica on the basis that he said every single person on that flight is a foreign national offender. Um, so, so that's why we need to be careful about um, uh, um, sort of falling into to that, to that trap um, that law um, sets for us. So in terms of where we go from here, um, in, in order to get uh, uh, towards an, abolition of pra an ab abolitionist practice in relation to immigration law and enforcement, we have to start by connecting the dots between abolition and empire um, in relation to immigration and how the law operates. Um, and to kind of think and sit carefully with the law um, and think, well, well, what do we do when 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 we need um, uh, to appeal to the law um, in order to um, to uh, uh, deal with individual cases and in fact that's all there is in terms of um, accessing the basic means of life um, at the same time as of course realizing that you then become ensnared in that trap and so I think um, for me I try in the book to kind of present um, what I call a counter pedagogy to immigration law that would that would begin to get us to think and speak differently about who is entitled to resources um, to understand Britain as being itself the spoils of empire um, and so when we're talking about um, immigration law, we're not seeing it as this harsh but fair mode for determining who is um, entitled to access to resources and who isn't, but itself um, an act of, of appropriation. And, and, and on the other side of that, it's about understanding irregularized um, movement as a part of a long history of anti-colonial resistance. Um, we should be thinking about irregularized migration um, you know, as 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 a as as a radical embodiment of anti-colonial practice, and that's not, of course, me calling for it as um, an abolitionist practice. I'm just recognizing that within it, um, it you know, it, it's very illegality, it's subversion of um, border controls. Um, is of course it does of course embody um, a, a radical anti-colonial and indeed reparative and redistributive dimension because in being illegal it, it requires a forcible return of something that was stolen in a context um, in which the laws being breached immigration and border controls are specifically designed to obstruct that outcome um but of course um that's not um, an abolitionist practice that we would be calling for it, it's it's about changing the way we think about it and talk about it. We wouldn't call for it in the sense that um, people who travel um, uh, irregularly are, of course, made vulnerable to extreme conditions of racial terror, both in their journeys and attempt to cross borders, as well as in their efforts to navigate legal status, um, recognition processes um, and hostile environment pre and post arrival. Um, so it's about um, insisting that um, Anti, that, that we're by, by seeing irregularized migration as anti-colonial resistance, we're insisting on a recognition um, that the mainstream and accepted story of Britain's making is a fiction. And it's a story that justifies the violence and injustice of Britain's contemporary border regime. Um, and so what I would say is that rather than being seen rightfully at the mercy of legal status recognition processes. Racialized people have to be both understood and understand themselves as being collectively entitled to reclamation of wealth accumulated by colonial dispossession. And I think that that, that uh, empowerment in itself and that understanding it is a first step to transformation um, because it is about it is about imbibing an abolitionist perspective because as we know, um, colonialism didn't only destroy, um, uh, um, didn't only cause physical destruction. It also caused um, psychic destruction. It, 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 you know, things like psyches and dreams and um, hopes and the sense of possibilities and senses of entitlement. You know, that's something that was those kinds of um, 
aspects of something that were really broken down and destroyed by colonialism. And so it's also about reclaiming um, um, and recovering um, and excavating some of that um, in order to 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 um, be able to feel empowered um, um, in in our strategizing collectively. Um, so I think um, yeah, I think I'm going to end there. Um, uh, just by saying that as scholars and activists, if we can acknowledge these connections between historical and ongoing projects of, of capitalism and empire, um, and we can, we can, it allows us to question former colonial powers and claims to being legitimate and defensible, defensible um, sovereign nation states with borders that they're entitled to enforce. And, 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 and once we begin to be able to question that and to, to feel our own entitlement um, and to recover some of our desires and senses of um, sense of entitlement and desire, we, we can we can move towards um, um, thinking together, which I hope we can in this event about what an abolitionist approach to um, uh, immigration enforcement could look like. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. Um, okay, I'd now like to um, ask Stella uh, for her introduction. Okay, thanks, Becca, and good evening, everybody. Um, I've prepared a slightly different self-introduction. I was simply going to talk about the work that I've done and how it relates to the themes that we're discussing this evening. Um, and I think the thing is that um, I was raised and schooled in the UK, but um, have travelled backwards and forwards to Ghana and other countries since I was very young. So in a sense, I have a foot in both camp. And my primary work through, um, before I retired anyway, was as a teacher. Um, and I moved on to train and empower educators at all levels across um, the UK and of course around the world. And a lot of that work was about looking at how to decolonize the curriculum and to examine our educational practice um, in a way that prevented the ongoing discrimination and um, other isms that young black people were facing in the classroom. Um, political engagement was very much around supporting anti-colonial liberation struggles, particularly on the African continent. Um, but I was also quite heavily involved in the UK civil rights movement. And as um, uh, I suppose a, a young black feminist um, involved in setting up an organization that was national and which allowed black women to speak from their own position about their particular experiences and their particular history. Um, I uh, was very keen period to ensure that whatever we did here kept one eye on what was happening in our countries of origins, both in terms of struggle for national liberation, but also um, the experience of neocolonialism that many of our countries moved into. Um, one of the things that I'm known for is The Heart of the Race, which was republished by Verso just a couple of years ago as a feminist classic and really tried very hard to locate the experience of black women in this country in that history of colonialism, that legacy of empire, by tracing the journey um, from pre-colonial Africa right through to migration entry into the UK um, post, post the Second World War. And what comes out very clearly in that book, which is based on oral testimony and which invites women to speak to their experience and to the experience of their, their, their families and their histories. What clearly is that our whole experience as migrants and settlers in the UK is to some extent shaped and molded by um, that former experience of colonialism, both in terms of how we are seen um, our economic status, our experience of state brutality, um, the immigration legislation, which uh, um, Nadine has spoken about so eloquently, 
and just in terms of our ability to survive and and grow in in this society um also worked for a period of time on the mayor's commission for african and asian heritage which was an attempt to look at how heritage organizations in london failed to reflect um, the diversity of the capital we live in and part of that involved taking evidence from others and um, others involved in the, the heritage industry about their failure to address these issues and to locate the history and the artifacts that they were presenting to the public in that um, context of empire and 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 legacy and I found it very interesting that many of the people we spoke to um, really did fail to make that connection about black history as if it came from another planet they um, often um, claim to feel ill-equipped to um, the realities um, in a way that was took an honest account of, of Britain's role in to some of these artifacts and in terms of the, the, the way the history was presented. Um, so I think it's really important that when we begin with um, discussions about decolonizing the curriculum and indeed um, decolonizing our heritage organizations and everything else, that we make a real effort to stop seeing black history as if it's something out there, as if it's something from another planet and recognize that there is no great in Great Britain. There is indeed, um, yeah, no great in Great Britain without that history of colonialism and slavery imperialism. Um, I think the other thing that I, I would like to say just by way of introduction is that my forthcoming book that's coming out um, next month, I believe, um, and will be published by Verso, um, which is entitled A Kick in the Belly, um, continues on that, that journey to try to uncover the hidden histories of, of black women and looks in particular at how black women resisted slavery and how um, their refusal to accept their status as enslaved beings contributed to the abolitionist movement that um, resulted in the legislation to abolish slavery in 1833-84. Um, that is a history that has often been underplayed or indeed ignored or misrepresented and it raises the whole issue of the extent to which other voices are heard in our debates and discussions about the kind of world we wish to see and the kind of legacies that we want to bequeath to our children. Um, I think that's all I'd like to say. I, I know that I haven't taken minutes, but I also am aware that we're running a little bit late through to through the technical issues that I had. So I'm very happy to pass on now, Becky, to the next speaker. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Stella. Um, okay, then I would like to welcome our next speaker, Kojo. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, um, let me just introduce myself. So first of all, my name is Kojo Karam, and um, I also teach at Bergbeck School of Law. Um, so, I, I, you know, I get to learn from our first speaker, Nadine, um, every day. And um, I hope that some of the stuff that I want to talk about today will feed into the presentation that Nadine offered, um, as well as um, the fantastic contribution that Stella just shared with us as well. Um, what I'm really going to focus on um, in the short period of time I'm going to speak to you is the relationship between um, Britain, its imperial history, um, and the commercialization and criminalization of the drugs trade. And through retelling the story of that history, um, hope to try and gain a little bit of an insight into how um, the dynamics of memorialization and um, nostalgia and forgetting of empire continue to inform um, our politics more in general uh, in this contemporary moment and also the specific um, debates um, around the, um, the, 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 the trade of drugs. Um, 
I'm going to start off with a with a little story, um, one that I think is illustrative. Otherwise, I wouldn't really bother telling it and wouldn't want to bring the protagonist into this evening. Um, it's a little story from Tony Blair's autobiography. Um, I know he's nobody that people wanted to encounter on this, um, you know, fine evening. Um, but there is a, a little throwaway vignette from his autobiography that I think is so illustrative about Bryn's relationship with its own colonial history overall, and it's particularly its relationship to, it, to, to, the, to the international drug trade. Um, so 1997, um, Tony Blair um, is fresh off his landslide of electoral victory and is um, one of his first assignments is to go to um, Hong Kong and facilitate the, the handover of, of, of what was then pretty much the last major British colony um, to the Republic of China. Um, so he writes his autobiography about flying over there and um, watching um, tearfully, um, uh, you know, his heart heavy with nostalgia whilst the Union Jack is lowered and, um, you know, the, the red flag of China is raised and, you know, well, what a lot of historians see as the kind of final um, the final um, exclamation point on formal British colonialism um, is really placed. Um, following that um, ceremony, um, Tony Blair then has to go and meet um, Zhang Zemin, the, the Chinese president. And um, as part of the conversation, um, the Chinese president says to him, um, well, hopefully, you know, now we've facilitated the handover um, of Hong Kong back to the Chinese, this can be a new point in British-Chinese relationships, and we can put all of our ugly, violent history um, behind us. And what's fascinating is that Tony Blair writes in his autobiography that as um, Zhang Zemin is telling him this, he has no idea about what this violent history that he's talking about and referring to. He's, like, he's never heard about it at all. And of course, the um, history that Zhang is is um, talking about is the, the Opium Wars. Um, uh, you know, the two major Opium Wars in the middle of the 19th century that um, concluded with the burning of the Imperial Summer Palace um, that facilitated the handover of um, Hong Kong to the British in the first place. So the fact that Tony Blair didn't know about this um, particular event made you question why he thought that Hong Kong was in British possession in the actual first place. But this is, you know, a, a major world historical event by any, any, any measurement. But here we have a, you know, boarding school educated, Oxford um, educated British prime minister who is not only completely ignorant about this event, but is openly writing about it without any embarrassment or shame, you know. Um, you can only imagine what the reactions would be if, say, a French president came over to Britain um, and openly admitted that they had no idea about, you know, the Battle of Waterloo. Um, you could imagine the mockery in the Daily Telegraph or whatever, but this is seen as normal within uh, a certain amount of British political history because of the way in which um, we uh, carry both uh, nostalgia about empire, as Blair shows, when he's kind of tearing up through the sadness of the loss of British imperial control of Hong Kong. And, you know, this is something that Nadine has written about wonderfully. Um, Paul Gilroy as well, when he talks about that melancholia, um, post-colonial melancholia that is carried over in the culture of Britain today. But it's also tied with a complete amnesia, a complete forgetting about the actual details of empire, about where the colonies were, about what the relationship happened in those colonies and what some of those major events are. Um, and I think that's really encapsulated in that particular moment. Um, a few elements about as to why, why this amnesia is produced. And I think that the Opium Wars is a, is a good example for us to understand that. And as Nadine mentioned a little bit earlier, the work the law does to facilitate this amnesia, I think is pretty significant. Um, because the main reason for the British Opium Wars was of course, the uh, attempt to prohibit the opium trade from the East India Company into mainland China by the Jing Dynasty and the um, waging of war um, as a response in order to enforce the trade of opium and force the, the Chinese population to accept um, yeah, the British um, opium products that were being produced in industrial scales within British India. Um, this type of corporate commercialized endeavor is how a lot of the British empire was actually grown, you know, not just through kind of state projects, but through, you know, what we might nowadays call private public partnerships. Um, 
this um, relationship with major corporations, whether that be the Hudson Bay Company in Canada, whether that be the Royal African Company in Edward Colston in um, West Africa, whether that be the East India Company um, within Asia, um, these corporate elements allowed for both the um, profiteering and financialization of the British Empire to, to far exceed its, its, its European, I mean, I don't want to say rivals because there's a lot of collaboration with Europe, European imperial project, but it's other the other European empires, um, but also plays the role of kind of privatizing this imperial history and um, blocking it from the kind of main national history that we're taught of, you know, kings and queens and the world wars and, you know, Dunkirk and all of that kind of nationalized story. Empires almost separated from that because of, you know, it's the realm of contract law and property law and these private corporations facilitating their own wealth on a global scale. And one of the main commodities for doing that over the course of the 19th century was what we would nowadays call um, in-law um, narcotic drugs. Um, not just opium from the, um, f you know, being produced in India and being sold around the world, which is a, you know, a major product of the British Empire, but also British British Institute of wide-scale coca leaf cultivation in Jamaica, Sri Lanka, British Guyana. Um, as late as um, 1895, the British government publishes a report after a Royal Commission on Opium is launched um, to investigate whether opium has any potential problems. And the Royal Commission concludes in its report that there is no evidence of any extensive moral or physical degradation as a result of, of opium use. You know, um, So this is at the very end of the 19th century. Um, it, opium trade and other drugs trade the scene as, um, yeah, potential avenues for commercial profiteering, similar to some of the other major psychiatric substances that were grown throughout empire, whether that be coffee, whether that be sugar, whether that be rum. Um, around the turn of the 20th century, there is, of course, a significant change in the relationship towards what we would now describe as drugs, this collection of substances that are grouped together really by the law and not by any kind of medical categorization, um, starting really with the 1909 Shanghai Opium Commission, driven to a large scale by both um, American um, superseding of the British Empire as the kind of global hegemon, um, and then also tightly related to legacies and ideas around race and around racial hier hierarchization and the fear about particular substances um, overturning those racial hierarchizations, essentially particular supposedly subaltern racial beings upon taking these psychotic substances, forgetting their place in society and transgressing those racial boundaries. This is explicit in a lot of the legislation that's passed, particularly in the United States of America, um, the 1875 city ordinance in San Francisco, Banning opium talks about how or it's leading to, you know, um, East Asian population um, corrupting the the kind of no pure Christian white American population. And um, when we talk about substances like cocaine in this relationship with um, the what was seen as supposedly subaltern, um, uh, uh, a kind of um, yeah, southern black population. Um, we can often see a lot of the same discourses, a lot of the same ideologies that continue to fuel the demonization of um, you know particular black people in America today. Um, you know, I thought when the George Floyd uh, murder happened, um, I you know watching it in horror. Uh, part of me also was just waiting to see how long will it take, how long until. Um, the explanation for this un unjustifiable, um, slow torture and murder of this person is provided by um, talking about levels of, uh, of drugs that they had in their body at that time, and it took about, about a week, and all of a sudden that explanation was being brought forward, similar as it had been with Trayvon Martin, that he had you know, a toxicology report to show that he had drugs in his system, similar as it was with Michael Brown. Um, and they didn't do it with Tamir Rice, who was, of course, only 12 years old, but they did try and say, um, oh, the Tamir Rice's mother, Samira Rice, was also involved in taking drugs and in the drugs trade. And so this idea of drugs being taken by particular populations, leading to them being almost uncontrollable and therefore justifying this kind of lethal violence um, that is that has driven, um, yeah, police brutality, um, particularly on black populations, is, is something that you can see right at the origin of the drugs trade being criminalized around that turn of the 20th century. Um, 
So the consequences of that criminalization, you know, have been devastating for any people who are committed towards um, confronting the legacies of, of racism and colonialism in our contemporary moment. Um, people can look at, you know, Michelle Alexander's Jim Crow, um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's Golden Gulags to talk about the, the, the reliance upon drug laws to fuel um, mass incarceration within the United States of America, but it also plays a great role here in the United Kingdom as well. Um, one out of every eight prisoners in the United Kingdom at the moment is currently imprisoned for drug offences. Um, it's the number one reason for stop and search, um, given out of all of the grounds, much more prevalent than the kind of knife crime um, headlines that we see in the newspapers. Um, I will just surely wrap it up um, quickly. Um, and I think there's also a really interesting question that hopefully I might be able to talk about a little bit later about the um, the way in which, at least for one of the, the main drugs that was criminalized over the 20th century cannabis, we're kind of seeing a return to this um, liberal commercialized um, idea of moving beyond criminalization. And so whilst we started with the commercialized profiteering from these drugs in the 19th century, we're now seeing a lot of the, the, the kind of major intellectual basis of kind of free market neoliberalism now throwing their support behind, uh, yeah, a very marketized version of, 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 of cannabis legalization. The Adam Smith Institute, the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, City AM, um, multiple members of the conservative government are throwing their weight behind cannabis legalization. Um, I really want to talk about how that is not what we would envision if we think about trying to facilitate drug policy reform in order to um, the, the, the end, end ambitions of a prison abolitionist movement. Um, there is there's ways of doing reform that can reinforce the violence and exclusion, particularly the economic violence upon um, you know black populations, populations from the global south. Um, and there's ways of doing cannabis reform that might be able to challenge and push back against that and work towards those wider abolitionist aims. Um, I'll leave that for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kojo. Okay, then I would like to invite our last speaker, Gracie. Thanks to all of the, thanks to all of the amazing organizers and also thanks to everybody else on the panel, um, I should say straight up that I'm not an academic, um, so just forgive me. Um, but no, I am kind of, I most of the time I'm reading, also writing, campaigning. Uh, I've spent a long time with half a foot ambivalently in the NGO sector, but outside of that, um, doing work with, I mean, a while ago now, but SOAS Detaining Support, who are an amazing small abolitionist uh, group that visit people in immigration detention and provide practical solidarity to them. Uh, also spent quite a long time campaigning with the Against Borders for Children campaign, which was again, a kind of small abolitionist grassroots campaign that was aiming specifically for one non-reformist reform, which was to stop the collection of nationality and country of birth data through the school census in the UK, um, because there were fears that turned out to be confirmed that that information would be used for immigration enforcement purposes. Um, and more recently, I've been kind of helping out with abolitionist reading groups and educational materials on abolition. And I suppose the other thing I should say is that I'm working on something with a good friend, um, Luke Dunarona, who many of you may have seen. He's just put his first book out, Deporting Black Britons. But I sort of, a lot of the stuff I've been thinking about <clears throat> politically recently, I've been thinking about with him. Um, so I don't want to kind of just say stuff and not bring him into the conversation in some way. So I was going, I'm kind of in a good position insofar as Nadine has really amazingly sort of covered everything I might have wanted to say um, about the immigration system, excuse me. Um, but I suppose thinking more generally about how empire informs our present, I guess I've been thinking about the way in which when you have the project, you know, when you have the colonial project begin in Britain, if you should give it a firm beginning, in political philosophy, that's coming at the same time as, you know, the Enlightenment. So this idea of man as a rights holder, 
And I think what we maybe don't talk enough publicly about that still reverberates in the present is how that status of being a rights holder, that status of being civilized, always has an outside, right? It always has an outside that is uncivilized, savage, undeserving in some way. There's always some lesser status against which deserving um, is, is defined. And I think that we, especially in British society today, continue to see many ways in which conditional or unequal citizenship is dispensed. And I don't just mean citizenship kind of formally, purely in terms of immigration law, but I mean kind of belonging in some way um, to a wider community. Um, we continue to see that rights and entitlements tend to be defined in some way, either explicitly by government or implicitly kind of more generally against some kind of outside. Um, and those outsiders tend to be produced through processes of racialization, criminalization, as Becca discussed increasingly, pre-criminalization um, through the law. So I suppose I wanted to speak a little bit about how those processes work in similar ways across policing in Britain, across counter-terror, across immigration enforcement. And obviously there are specificities in state practice in all of these areas, but I think it's useful to think about them together. Because if you think about something like gangs policing or the gangs matrix, if you think about prevent, if you think about immigration enforcement, all of these are state practices that assign somebody some kind of suspect status, whether that's gang nominal or extremist or illegal immigrant. And then that status is used not just to kind of stigmatize you in public discourse and position you as not worthy of rights, but also in practice to deny you access to all of the essential goods and services that you would need to flourish either by explicitly making you ineligible for them in some way, as, as is the case under the hostile environment, or by making you fear that you can't access, access those services safely or confidentially without your personal information being in some way shared with another part of the carceral state. So you would end up potentially being scared to speak to your doctor for fear that they might refer you to prevent, um, you might find that your local, you know, that the local police force has shared your details with the housing, social housing team, with the local authority, because they think that you're a gang nominal and that you therefore find it more difficult to potentially access housing. So I guess I've been in thinking about how empire and colonial modes of governance inform our present, I've been thinking about that production of outsiders. And of course, in the context of colonialism, as Nadine talks about, up to a certain point, nominally, everybody had the same status as citizen of the UK and colonies. Um, that did not mean that national health services were being built in, you know, all of all of the UK's overseas territories. That's not what happened, right? That's not what happened at all, because people living there had some kind of other outsider status. Um, so I think it's I think when organizing in the UK can sometimes be really quite siloed, um, thinking through empire can maybe help us think through some of the links between those areas and think about what is going, what the state is doing in a similar way in different areas that might require some kind of broader based response than simply going straight after just prevent or just after the hostile environment or just after the gangs matrix indeed. Um, I also think it's helpful to think about empire because it helps us to explain why an abolitionist response is required and why other responses might be insufficient if our aim is for people not to suffer the kinds of harms that we do. Um, because I think thinking about empire and colonialism helps us to explain how certain systems were designed to function the way they do. So as Nadine kind of has set out in relation to the Windrush scandal and the hostile environment, helps us to understand why certain systems are not kind of going wrong and need to be more inclusive or better, but actually why those systems are beyond reform because their purpose was never kind of compatible with the liberation of lots of people.
Um, so if you think, if you understand that the police force was designed to suppress anti-colonial uprising and to protect colonial wealth and to suppress organised labour, um, you start to understand why actually calling for more training so that there's less stop, disproportionate stop and search probably isn't going to cut it. Um, and then briefly, I wanted to speak a little bit about technology. Um, and I'm normally really, really wary and kind of trying to caution us against sort of importing liberation narratives from the US. But I think there's been some really great uh, scholarship and activism around new technologies and the racialized dimensions of new technologies in the US. And we obviously are not in the exact same context in the UK, but I think there's some useful learnings um, that, that we could that we could draw on from there. Um, and I think, I mean, I think what Kojo said about public private partnerships in this arena more than anything is, um, is really, really relevant because what we increasingly see is state, the state potentially doesn't have capacity to build some kind of tool and or some private tech company has already managed to build some kind of tool um, and is marketing that to states, you know, wherever. Um, so I think that's another reason to be listening to what's going on in the US because those corporations are kind of, they're transnational. Um, once a technology is normalized in one place, they're gonna try and sell it for that purpose in another place. And I'm thinking specifically about um, Palantir. So there's a really uh, amazing activist group called Mihenti who have been running the No Tech for ICE campaign in the States. And if you look at their sort of initial report, they set out really carefully um, sort of their concerns about Palantir, which has been providing a lot of the technological infrastructure for the sort of intensified immigration enforcement regime that we've seen under Donald Trump. And they sort of set out, um, they set out how sort of technologies that tend to be deployed first against people often in war zones in the global south then come home um, to be used against racialized populations um, domestically. Um, so they speak about the fact that Palantir was established with support from a CIA-linked CIA venture capital fund. Um, a lot of its initial business was done with the American government in Afghanistan and Iraq and now they are powering Trump's deportation machine. Um, their founder has been accused of kind of white nationalist links, is a very vocal Trump um, supporter. And Mihenti are really good in that they set out that this kind of pattern is, it, you know, it's not new with Palantir. So, you know, they talk about seeing assault rifles, obviously weapons of war used against Black Lives Matter protesters in Ferguson or facial recognition technology initially being developed as an anti-insurgency tool um, for Iraq and Afghanistan and then being deployed against protesters in Baltimore and of course in the UK we see by the police increasingly against kind of working class and, and racialized populations. Um, and I suppose the reason I wanted to speak a little bit about Palantir is just that when you look at the companies that are named in the Mahenti report alongside Palantir as helping to power kind of this infrastructure of immigration enforcement. What you also see is that many of those companies have been contracted in a pretty shadowy way to help, um, well, they've been contracted by the UK government um, nominally to assist with data analytics in the context of the NHS response to COVID-19. And I think as abolitionists, we have to think really carefully about what it means for corporations that have generally been, not generally, but that have been making their money, um, kind of supporting racialized surveillance and um, racialized kind of state violence um, against people. What does it mean when those companies then hold um, kind of significant roles in UK critical infrastructure? I don't think that's something that we can um, sort of allowed to, to pass us by. So I just wanted to sort of open the conversation about technology a little bit, but we could talk more, more about it um, in, the, in the later discussion. And I think just returning to this point about colonial modes of governance always requiring an outside or an other, I think what that means for abolitionist strategy is that an abolitionist strategies 
that succeed are going to be ones that refuse appeals to innocence and also appeals to inclusion. And obviously, I'm not the first person to say that, you know, Jackie Wang, Ruthie Gilmore, lots of people have written um, in really, really compelling ways um, about the danger of appeals to innocence. And I think that links quite closely with what Nadine was saying about the danger of appeals to recognition. Um, but we can see, you know, thinking about tech, first of all, you know, the line is this tech, this facial recognition misrecognizes women and black people and black women worst. And some of the lines that you get are, let's make it better at recognizing black people. Um, let's have more black people building the technology. And an abolitionist strategy is obviously going to be able to identify that being involved in building oppressive technology is, is not going to be a pathway to liberation. And that obviously, it sounds obvious, but it's not obvious when you look at some of the arguments that, that end up being run in this context. Um, I also think that an abolitionist strategy around borders invites us to think about care and belonging outside of the container of the nation state. So what would it mean to have relationships with distant and near others that aren't mediated by, you know, well, I'm from this country, you're from this country, and these, these are boundaries of, of what I owe you, what you owe me, or just our concern for one another. Um, I think an, abolish, an abolitionist strategy on borders also invites us to think about what relations would need to be changed not just interpersonally, but at the global level to make borders obsolete. Um, I don't think there are easy answers to that question, but I think an abolitionist lens helps us to think that through. And I think last, an abolitionist strategy um, invites us to resist appeals to proportionality and also just invites us, I think, maybe this is just me, I'm interested in what others think, but it invites us to a real ambivalence about the state, which I think in the context of, you know, calls to defund in X and invest in Y, um, that's an ambivalence that we that we need to maintain. Um, so yeah, I will leave it there because I know that there's loads of really interesting questions um, and look forward to discussing. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gracie. Um, so just kind of going off the back of uh, what Gracie was talking about in terms of our kind of strategies and language, um, I'd like to ask one question we have, um, and maybe ask Stella to respond to this first. Um, so what does an abolitionist practice that, acknowledge, that acknowledges not only the histories, but also the ongoing existence of empire look like? How is the legacy of empire enforced today and what strategies and perhaps also messages and tactics and framing uh, do we have available to resist this enforcement? Um, Stella, if you'd be open to answering it. Sorry, Becky, could you ask somebody else for a minute? I just need to get my notes sorted. Absolutely. Um, I can, Nadine, would you be interested to answer? <laughs> sorry, can you repeat the question in that case? Sorry, I thought it was, I'm so sorry. Of course. Um, what does an abolitionist practice that acknowledges not only the histories, but also the ongoing existence of empire look like? How is the legacy of empire enforced today? And what strategies and perhaps our tactics, our language, etc., do we have available to resist this enforcement? Yeah, so the question is as massive as I thought it was. Um, I was hoping it would be narrowed down by asking to repeat it, but it is huge. Um, I mean, look, the short answer is I don't know. Um, it's difficult to, um, I find it very difficult to um, imagine um, what a, a perfect solution to a horrific problem would look like. Um, but I think I tried a little bit in, in what I said to speak about kind of some of the steps that I think we need to take towards being in a position to be to imagine um, a future that doesn't exist um, now. And for me, I find language and words um, so important in kind of opening doors um, to to be able to to think differently and to to be able to stay with complex problems and troubling um, 
environments and and to think our way through them. And I think and I think that's why um, we need to look at uh, structures differently. We need to look at the law differently. So when we look at the law, we don't see it as having fallen from the sky and being and being what it says it is, which is about justice and about neutrality and about fairness and about um, uh, uh, making sh making sure that who is entitled to something gets it and who isn't entitled doesn't get it. So it's about looking at at, at law, um, you know, not not in that way and and thinking, well, what what is it really? Um, where does it come from? Where does it originate? And you know, that's why it's important to kind of um, to to look at what law is. And if we look at it as a system of categorization, for example a system of meaning making through language and, and categorization, um, we can actually see then um, how it operates. And that's really important. So we can see that it that that it's that its origins um lie in uh in very much in, in colonialism or that it shares it shares a lot in the way that it operates it shares a lot um um with um colonial um strategies and practices so if we think about colonialism it was all about um setting out to know particular cultures and societies and civilizations civilizations to order them to categorize um things people plants everything and to file them under particular um 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 names and and once and, and then it was and then and then the colonizers acted on this so-called knowledge um and i think that's a very that's a very dangerous um that's a very dangerous and violent thing to try to do to order the world in a particular way and then to, uh, uh, and to 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 categorize people in hierarchies and then to act accordingly um, on the basis that this knowledge is somehow correct. Um, and so there's so much work to be done in, in breaking down that meaning and finding other meaning um, and, and, and thinking, and, and once we get to the point where we have um, uh, understood the origins of law and the way in which law operates um, and, and, and what it shares in common with colonial practices, we can then begin to kind of think, well, you know, what would what would a counter pedagogy to law look like? How how could we think um, and speak differently? Um, how can we um, subvert the language used by the colonial state? How can we how can we um, use a language that we've that we've um, come up with and understandings that we've come up with um, that don't rely on 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 state structures? And I think that when we start doing that, and when we start speaking to each other in these ways, um, it's like Bell Hooks says. Um, you know, we need to stop being so preoccupied with looking for that other for recognition. Instead, we should be recognizing ourselves and then seeking to make contact with all those who would engage us in a constructive manner. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think I, it's difficult to imagine to imagine sort of perfect futures, but I think it is possible to begin to take steps towards them um, um, together in this way. Brilliant, Stella. Would you be up for answering um, that one now about the kind of... Yeah, can you just repeat the question again, Becky, please? Of course. It is in the chat section on the on the screen on StreamYard as well. Um, okay, well, I'm not seeing it. Okay, okay, okay. Right, I beg your pardon. So it's what abolitionist practice that acknowledges the histories but the ongoing existence of empire looked like? Um, how is the legacy of empire enforced? What strategies, what language, what tactics do we have to resist this? Um, I think the strategies are about obviously acknowledging the legacies of empire and, and um, the, the, the history that we're debating. Um, but I think it's also about learning from the history and ensuring that we don't repeat the mistakes that have been made in the past. Personally, I'm very tired of, of documentaries, films and uh, news reports that just count of the historical context. And as a historian, I think that um, I'm constantly screaming at the television um, because much of that history is hidden and uh, remains unacknowledged. Um, I think a perfect example of that is the anti-migrant um, narrative which um, 
just fails completely to acknowledge the role and other European states have played in um, the conditions that people are fleeing, um, the war and the deprivation, hunger and the, and the horror. And, um, you know, whether we, we look at Palestine, whether we look at Syria, whether we look at the Congo, whether we look at Saka, um, we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, people are hungry and people are desperate um, because of a long history which Britain has to, has to acknowledge and take responsibility for. So in terms of um, uh, legacy and what strategies we have available, for me as a teacher, I think the primary strategy is education. It has to be something that starts in the classroom. It has to be something that um, enables young people not only to um, understand warts and all, but also to locate themselves within it in a way that um, no longer leaves them invisible and which helps them to recognise and to embrace their own agency. Um, I don't know whether that answers the question, but that's, that's this kind of thinking that I've been um, having, the kind of thoughts, I should say. Yes, definitely does. Um, I'm really interesting, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to bring in, this is a question from uh, an audience member. What do the panel think of conceptualizing abolition as a form of reparation for empire, given the police and prisons disproportionately harm the same racialized groups empire did slash does? Um, that question should also be on your screens now. Um, I wonder if Kojo would be interested in speaking to this. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, I mean, I think what I'll do is probably just really focus on the way in which current debates around particularly cannabis reform are wrestling with this question of um, repairing the harm that the war on drugs have done and, you know, us, you know, just explicitly describing that within the language of reparations, which is something that I think is a really exciting development in terms of political organization. I really want to um, shout out the work of an amazing sister who runs um, the Drug Policy Alliance, which is the major drug um, policy NGO in the United States of America called Cassandra, Cassandra Frederick. And, um, you know, any of the writing that she's done on, on, on reparations and, and drug policy, I think, is really worth engaging with. Um, in short, the question is around how might the um, previous era of mass criminalization and mass incarceration dis massively disproportionately of black people, not only in the United States of America, but in the United Kingdom, but in Brazil, but in Colombia, but in South Africa, you know, the, the editor collection I wrote was looking at all these different jurisdictions and the same dynamics at play in each, in each one of them. You know, how is the ending of that era going to um, improve the lives of the people who were disproportionately impacted by that era of the war on drugs? And that's what people are thinking about in terms of, of cannabis reform now, because, you know, as much as these systems of capitalism and colonialism remain the same over the centuries, they also change and they also adapt and that's how they manage to renew themselves and we're seeing that at the moment with um, cannabis legalization in the United States of America. Um, in some of the early states that legalized it, um, the legalization included um, requirements such as if you have been convicted of a federal offense, which obviously includes um, uh, you know, cannabis dealing, you were barred from being able to get a, um, a cannabis dispensary license, being able to work in a cannabis dispensary, and there was no commuting of sentences, um, no redress of the harm of the people who actually, um, yeah, had, had been had been dramatically disproportionately imprisoned for for cannabis trade. So you know, places like Colorado, you had on one side of the state, um, you know, um, hedge funded. Um, you know, kind of uh, Wall Street funded um, hedge funds running cannabis dispensaries, making billions of pounds now off this um, new industry. And at the same time, in the other part of the state, people still serving out their prison sentences for cannabis dispensary, um, for, for, for cannabis distribution. And so that kind of um, 
uh, legalization um, for me is not a positive um, change for those, and I don't think for anybody committed to questions of trying to challenge the legacies of racism and colonialism. This is actually reinforcing it and is facilitating further economic and racial inequalities. Um, there have been some challenges towards that in more recent states, and, and this has been framed in the kind of language of, of um, reparations, so talking about um, in Ohio, um, organizers um, will manage to have a requirement of 15% of licenses to go directly only to black, black populations. Um, in some of the more recent states that have passed it, when we're thinking about um, some of the cities in California, but also probably Massachusetts, which is one of the most encouraging ones, um, there has been the commuting of sentences not only people who are currently in prison, but also people who might have left prison, but their cannabis conviction stops them being able to work in a whole load of public sector jobs. That's been um, uh, removed. And there has been an attempt to ensure that the um, the imposition of a, of a legal cannabis um, market facilitates the economic redistribution towards communities that have been traditionally excluded, primarily um, African-American communities. Um, in terms of how that's been realized, I don't think that any of them have been wholly successful, and I don't think any of them have achieved the kind of wide-scale reparation, economic and also psychic reparation, as I said earlier before, that would be necessary in order to try and create that kind of new world of hope that we envision. But I do think that it's 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 fantastic to, to see the debates that are happening within this particular subfield of kind of um, race, law, policing, prisons, um, as really trying to hold on to that question of, no, this isn't just about getting the legal change. This isn't just about, you know, stopping um, the laws being on the books that allow people to stop and search and arrest young black people. If we're going to legalize this particular market, and if we're going to go back to the 19th century where this is a source of profit for transnational corporations, um, we are only going to do that if that's done in a way that allows for the, for the for the vast majority of the wealth that's being produced to be transferred back to the people who've had their lives devastated, um, you know, for the past hundred years as, uh, of the war on drugs. Thanks so much, Kojo. Um, Gracie, I'm wondering if uh, perhaps elaborating on a bit of the work that you're doing um, with Luke and stuff like that, whether this would also feel like relevant to you as well. It is relevant. Um, I don't think I've got to the end of what I think about it. Like basically, I think I have a little bit of unease. Um, I think not with what Kojo has just outlined i just sometimes wonder whether reparation captures maybe it's a sort of necessary but insufficient part of the frame i wonder if it captures everything that would happen and all of the people like people who nominally were owed nothing by like former colonial states would also benefit hugely from abolition. So I just wonder, um, yeah, I just wonder to what extent reparation alone can kind of capture that. And especially what I think when we think about the immigration system and when we complicate a bit what we think about what is actually going on in the immigration system in terms of, yes, we know there's obviously disproportionate enforcement against ethnic minorities, but then how do we, or, you know, what's our account of what happens to, for example, Eastern Europeans and so on. So I just, I don't have a fully formed thought on it, but it's a framing that I have been thinking about, we have been thinking about, um, and I'm not sure I'm all the way to the end of it. Great, thanks so much. Um, I guess the next question kind of uh, teases out more of this thought um, and will maybe help kind of our panelists as well as our audience members think through what those those practical steps and what uh, what does reparation uh, for empire look like and um, how this operates practically. Um, so this is a kind of practical organising type, type question. Um, what does solidarity and partnership look like in contemporary resistance to imperialism? Um, and are there specific demands uh, from the global south or from quote unquote former former colonies uh, that need to be heard um, that 
need to be incorporated into movement work um, or that have been as their kind of previous anti-imperialist solidarity work that already informs um, what we do, but perhaps that history has to be teased out and made more uh, explicit. Um, Stella, I wonder if you'd be interested to talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, I think that um, he shows us that our most effective strategies are based on people coming together to overcome that they encounter and present a united front. So one of the strategies has to be a sense of unity. Um, I don't think that in partnership can happen if people retreat into their silos and if they argue simply from a position of self-interest, which often to me is the case. I know that when I was writing A Kick in the Belly, um, one of the questions that engaged me was how um, the history of enslavement actually informs our practice today. Um, it was a worry to me that people would read the book and just find that episode in our history quite depressing and disempowering. And I think um, one of the ways that my thinking developed as I was writing that, that was that actually slavery is alive and kicking today. Um, and many of the experiences that we know about the Coffle line and continued through the Middle Passage and into the plantations and indeed uh, beyond abolition. Um, those those practices continue to be played out today and, and there's, you know, the bodies of black women litter the ocean. Um, women who have struggled across the Sahara and who have uh, risked life and limb in their efforts to escape um, discrimination and exploit, exploitation in their countries of origin. So um, part of our solidarity and partnership has to recognize that black lives matter, not only when they are abused or taken in uh, the global north, but actually um, the, their black lives are, are based in the global south. Um, it frustrates me to some extent that our energies are put into um, speaking out against injustices in our own countries here when daily children are dying of, of, of preventable diseases um, and their lives are also black lives. So I think, you know, solidarity has to have as a starting point an understanding of the way imperialism works and the way, um, uh, you know, our, our current government, we're talking about Trump or, or Johnson or anyone else, um, continue to play out this 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 assumption that somehow um, the situation we've inherited is fair and just. In terms of the specific demands, I think that the, the you know increasingly the demand from the former colonies is about sheer survival. It's about um, you know the basic needs the. Um, food, clothing and shelter needs that, that uh, we take for granted here. And um, I suppose what to think is that for many of us, you know, rethinking how we live, rethinking how we structure our societies and what um, institutions should or should not exist has to involve not only uh, thinking outwards, but also thinking about the privileges and um, other things that we take for granted that we may, if we're genuinely committed to, to a more world, have to uh, give up. Um, that's part of the, the, the contradiction, isn't it? When we talk about um, trying something new and something better um, for our children and our grandchildren to inherit, um, we may be talking about a world in which we don't have access to the material goods and um, the privileges that, that um, many of us have taken for granted and grown up with. 
Thanks. 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 I'm, just I'm just wondering um, from, from Nadine how do you feel about this question um, and the kind of, uh, as Stella was talking about, the way in which um, a lot of these discussions centre uh, what's going on within the borders of um, of the UK or, or other kind of, uh, former colonising nations and whether, um, yeah, how how you kind of think uh, of this in your work. Thanks, um, Becca. Yeah, um, well, I agree with much of what um, Stella said. Um, I think that our politics has to be um, coalitional, it has to be um, internationalist, it has to be anti-imperialist and it needs to be, um, uh, and we need to connect, we need to connect those dots and we need to not think in terms of silos and we need to not think in terms of um, nationalism or national boundaries um, as being sort of the extent and reach of our politics, uh, absolutely. And I think there's definitely a risk of that um, and we see it um, happening. Um, um, in various um, uh, places within within um, you know anti-racist struggle, and so I think it is important to be um, vigilant and, and work towards a, um, a a coalition of politics. And I think one of the things that really lifted me in that regard, and I think is a really wonderful example of how to um, how to make space for that kind of um, truly. Um, coalitional anti-imperialist politics is when we saw um, in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uprising that we saw over the summer um, and you know something something that really moved me was the um, was 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 Grenfell United's action where they um, uh, projected the the words um, "I can't breathe" on 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 Grenfell Tower fire. Th that for me really captured this um, both the kind of the the tragedy of that um, uh, of that instance where you had a, a a community who who couldn't speak the words anti racism or racism a a around what happened to them um, for fear of disrupting the official process, which of course um, leaves racism out of its terms. Um, for fear of um, uh, um, looking like, uh, you know, for for fear of, um, you know, when you're when you're dealing with a, a a Muslim, a predominantly Muslim community, you know, because of the war on terror, because of prevent, um, it's it's just impossible to have a a, um, a a a politics, a political struggle that isn't then constructed immediately as as violent or terrorist. And I think. Um, you know the, the the Black Lives Matter uprising empowered the the um, Grenfell survivors and families to say, you know, you know, our loved ones couldn't breathe either. Um, their last words, as they called the fire service, were, were that they couldn't breathe. And I think that 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 action for me was so powerful in connecting the dots um, between imperial forms of violence that end up. You know, like imperial wars, which then construct particular communities within within this national boundary as being, um, um, you know, always capable of violence or, or terrorist terror suspects simply by existing, um, as being racialized as Muslim, um, which then becomes calamitous in the wake of something like the the, the Grenfell Tower fire, where people can't then speak um, the violence that their loved ones have been su subjected to, um, and they can't draw on solidarity networks and, and because, um, they cannot, um, um, speak, um, um, in a way that maybe other groups, um, are able to. And that was for me such a powerful, um, symbol of what, um, anti-racist coalitional kind of, um, politics can look like. Um, so yeah, I think I just, I just stop there and leave that as an example of, 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 one way in which I'd like to see anti-racist politics become kind of really embraced as something coalitional and broad um, and not siloed and um, yeah, um, exclusionary um, or, or sort of, you know, falling into sort of a hierarchy of, 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 of oppression and a sort of competition for the status of who's most oppressed. Thanks Nadine. Okay, so taking this just uh, ever so slightly further. Um, I just, obviously the title uh, of this panel itself comes from a Fanon quote 
criticizing liberation movements that ultimately recreate capitalist uh, neo-colonial forms of exploitation. So with this as our title, um, I'd just like to ask um, perhaps Kojo, uh, if you're up for it, um, how you understand um, contemporary anti-imperialist and liberation movements that are also anti-capitalist, how do we build them? Are they necessarily like this? Um, and how do calls to reinvest public funding when we're talking about kind of problems within the bounds of UK borders uh, and the importance of uh, generating communities of care and investment and support for people. What do those kind of demands mean um, when we understand that the, his, the wealth of, of the UK comes from violent extraction um, and how do we make those demands? What do the, the kind of implications of those demands mean globally when that is the history um, of the wealth uh, that is held here? Um, yeah, AJ. Um, brilliant. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'll try not to take too much time as I also want to hear everybody else's ideas on this. But I think that, you know, I really like the title of this, this particular panel, returning to, you know, Fanon's concepts around how national liberation struggles in that kind of formal decolonized era, you know, would lead to the, um, you know, kind of a, the, the betrayal of the national bourgeoisie as um, upon seizing the kind of instruments of state would then re reinscribe um, uh, kind of colonial, colonialist capitalist extraction, um, you know, back onto the native population, um, often in, in, in just as attractive ways as, as the previous colonial era. And, um, you know, you know, Fanon is particularly in his last book, Le Damne de la Terre, is trying to think through how can we avoid the the re reproduction of this particular moment, and 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 he really, um, you know, he, 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 whilst of course a lot of his work is a a critique of of traditional Marxism, particularly, um, you know, when you think about Black Orpheus and his response to to Sartre, you know, by the end of Le Damne de la Terre, you know, people often talk about on violence in the first chapter, but people don't often read it all the way to the very end, um, where he is, uh, you know, concludes with a real appeal towards um, the the working classes, the the economically oppressed of um, the former colonial areas of Europe, um, with the line of, and you know, they need to stop playing, you know, the game of Sleeping Beauty, and to realise this kind of shared um, uh, political liberation and how reliant that is upon the um, upon the economic liberation of what is then called called the third world. And, and I think that that's something that we really want to return to when we try and conceptualize, you know, what does anti-imperialism mean, um, you know, in this modern day? I think that, you know, what Stella and Nadine were talking about in avoiding this kind of narrow nationalist boundaries of um, understanding our political commitments, of only thinking about, you know, what happens within the United Kingdom, or what only happens in terms of, you know, austerity or whatever we have, going on over here and you know forgetting about the way this is this is part of a global system is is particularly it's myopic generally and it, it, it is a limitation of politics but it's particularly myopic you know in somewhere like Britain which is which was the former heart of the imperial world and is still in a lot of ways um the the kind of nexus of this kind of global system of capitalist um, extraction. You know, we often think about how America supersedes it as an imperial power in the 20th century, but you know, the you know some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves as anti-imperialists, you know, in in Britain today, you know, is questions like why are most of the world's tax havens um, still British overseas territories? Places like the Cayman Islands and the British Virgin Islands, Gibraltar, Guernsey, Jersey. You know, that ability for um, transnational capital to be able to extract wealth from um, democratically governed countries and be able to um, silo them off within these tax havens is is always going to be a huge um, hurdle to overcome any kind of global trade transformation that people might wanna might wanna work against and that's something that those committed to anti imperialism within Britain have to really think about you know why is you know as a as a legal scholar you know these are questions that we continue to encounter you know why is London's commercial court still the world's number one court for for for, for, for resolving capitalist um, uh, uh, conflicts uh, of, of interest. You know, when we have um, multinationals um, competing over um, profit extraction from all around the world, they choose to come to London's commercial court. They choose to argue their cases within the English common law system, within the system of property law and contract law that we have, 
because this is seen as still the place where that global system of capitalist accumulation can really find its safe haven. And so these are um, yeah, questions that as anti-imperialist based in Britain today, I think that we need to take seriously and we need to try and answer them in order to try and show our commitment to those struggling for their own um, improvements in life all around the world. I was just going to come in there. Um, I think maybe more prosaically, I just think it's really important to maintain to maintain a class analysis and to maintain an analysis of how racism and capitalism relate to one another. I think you kind of that material relation, it's possible to have an analysis of colonialism and of empire that that just doesn't take into account that material relation and then you end up in kind of a not hugely helpful place i mean i suppose just on a more practical note i think if you look at some of the conversations that have followed um the kind of black lives matter uprisings i shouldn't be surprised but i am always a bit surprised at how we so quickly in the uk sort of then end up with like a conversation about how people find it hard being people of colour in the charity sector when like this protest movement was started because like the police murdered somebody, um, murdered a black man. I think sometimes it's easy to move away from the specificities of how the state operates and as Ruthie Gilmore would say, produces vulnerability to premature death and to instead kind of just have a woollier easier conversation that's dominated by more articulate uh, middle-class people, essentially um, perceived to be more articulate middle-class people. I mean, by people that put these panels on, et cetera, not generally. Um, so I think it's really important. If we think about what Ruthie Gilmore says in terms of capitalism requires inequality, racism enshrines it. And when we think about how she complicates that narrative around the prison, in the US being the continuation of slavery and actually looks really closely at all of the different surpluses that were made use of in order to kind of produce the prison as a response to those different surpluses of capital and population and land. Um, we see that there's something more complicated going on. Um, and I just think that there can be a tendency for things to be really simple sometimes. I think obviously because that's in the interest of the state um, and that's in the interest of everyone who has a lot of power under the current system, right? It's much better that we're talking about our, you know, terrible experiences in our middle class jobs than we are about, you know, I don't know, the, the fact that there were cleaners at the Ministry of Justice that died because it didn't close in the context of the pandemic and have had to crowdfund to, to repatriate people's bodies and so on. Um, it's obviously in someone's interest that that's where the conversation is. And it's um, it's obviously, I'm thinking about Amiri Baraka, but it's obviously in somebody's interest that, you know, that we maybe talk about racism and we don't talk about capitalism and we don't talk about how the two constitute the two constitute one another so yeah I, I know that I've not just sort of outlined a kind of strategy for how you actually build the movement but I think you, that you have to start with the analysis at least you can't miss that out Stella if you could yeah, yeah Becky I think I think I just want to echo what Gracie said um I don't know who said it but um there's a quote that empire was built on the fields, the playing fields of Eton. And um, I think that's a really resonant quote for me in the sense that so much of uh, what we experience in terms of capitalism and neocolonial structure are fundamentally about class. And certainly um, there are people in South Africa and many other so-called liberated countries um, who have fought for their freedom um, only to find that, you know, they have a new flag and a new national anthem, but the exploitation continues. Um, so we can't just envisage a world where we replace our old white colonial masters with, with black ones. Um, we need people who are prepared to go beyond nationalism, 
and identity politics and really demand a complete redistribution of the wealth. And I think there's also a need for us to hold our leaders and our spokespeople accountable um, so that the kind of world that we dream of can actually be, be realised and, and not scuppered by, by greed and, and self-interest. Um, if we think about neocolonialism, it couldn't exist without the complicity of people who claim to represent us and who claim of us. Um, I did want to say something about the second part of your question, which was about calls to reinvest public funding into generative life giving alternatives. And um, I think what I wanted to say was, you know, there's a lot of gesture politics going on at the moment. There's a lot of um, tweaking around the edges that really doesn't have anything to do with the racism and the day-to-day -day exploitation and injustice that people um, I do not think that taking down a couple of episodes of 40 Towers is really going to have any impact on the uh, lack of representation or the invisibility or all the other injustices that, that um, uh, are part of, uh, of the construct. Um, I also think that we need to recognise that the violence is actually embedded in, in the clothes that wear that were um, constructed in some or manufactured in some Indian sweatshop. Um, the violence is in the food we eat um, that necessitates sing single crop production and, and denies people access to their own land and their own uh, food and water resources. Uh, we are polluting our oceans and, and our skies and ignoring the consequences for future generations. And, you know, all of those things are um, conditions that we can individually take responsibility for. Um, there is definitely a sense in which our society continues to steal and extract wealth. Um, and, you know, right down to the mobile phones that we and the wars that are generated and the arms trade that feeds those wars, all of those things come down to how the individual choices that we make. So I suppose to say in a kind of roundabout way is it's not just about mobilization and organization and uh, coming together, although that's a hugely important part of what we would seek to achieve. It's also about the individual choices that we, we each of us make. And uh, I certainly think that, you know, we need to focus out as well as focusing in, even in terms of the discussion about um, de defunding the police. Um, one of the things that concerns me is the rise of militarism and, um, you know, the number of mercenaries who in the world who have no accountability to any state whatsoever. So, um, as I say, we can we can focus on our own police force here and the injustices or the brutalities that we experience, but we also need to put it into that broader anti-imperialist context. I think that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Stella. It's a really um, important note. Uh, I'm afraid that that uh, brings us to the end of our discussion. I'm so sorry to anybody who's question was not asked. We did have a, loads of really interesting questions um, on teaching practices, on public health. Um, so, but I'm afraid that we can't get to everybody. Um, we obviously started slightly late, so we'll run over maybe just by a couple of minutes. I'd just like to ask each of the speakers for any closing comments or shout outs um, to organizations, groups and resources that they might like to include. Um, Nadine, if you'd be able to go first. Um, I don't think that I have um, anything to add. Um, I agreed with um, what the what what Stella and Gracie said in relation to the last question, and um, I just want to thank um, all, everyone for coming tonight and for all the comments and questions which I've been following with with a lot of interest, um, and to all the speakers on the panel who I learned a lot from, um, and of course thanks so much to everybody who organised this and brought it together. Thank you. Um, Kojo, if you had any last comments. Um, just to say that, yeah, I think this has been such a fantastic um, 
conversation for really getting to the, you know, to the crux of how these systems of empire, racism, capitalism continue to reproduce themselves. I think that, um, you know, very much like Stella was talking about uh, in the last response that, yeah, and also Grace as well, there's been this real kind of slippage following the conversations around Black Lives Matter into trying to turn this into a simply a kind of culture wars argument, you know, and uh, about, you know, faulty towers and, and you know, all these, um, yeah, kind of culture war trigger points that will, that, that, that will try and empty out the content of the, of the, of the, of the, of the systemic critique that's being offered. Um, look, I, I'm as guilty as anyone, you know, I, I enjoy shouting at some old racist about why Land of Hope and Glory should be banned. That's just what I like to do. I find that entertaining, but it's not the same as substantive engagement with questions around, um, you know, how law, how economics, how institutions like the, like the removal center, like the prison, you know, like the border, how these institutions reproduce, like the corporation reproduce the, these histories of violences that we're trying to trying to oppose against. And I just, yeah, I want to thank all of the speakers today for like I say, educating me on how we can think about and talk about these issues better and yeah, just be more rigorous in terms of our critique. Thank you. Thank you. Gracie, if you have any last comments for us. Yeah, sure. Um, so I mentioned um, SOAS detainee support earlier who visit people in immigration detention and they're actually visiting groups kind of up and down the UK that you can that you can join if you think that that's kind of practical support you might be able to offer. Um, there's a new campaign being done by um, kids of colour called uh, No Police in Schools, which is really exciting. And there's the No More Exclusions campaign. There's basically, there's lots of kind of small groups doing really amazing abolitionist work, which, um, you know, I think would really benefit from people taking a look at what they're up to and thinking about how you can support them. But otherwise, I'd just like to say um, thanks so much to the organisers and also to my fellow panellists from whom I think I've learned an awful lot. And also, I think the really interesting conversation about drugs in the comments. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. And Stella, any last comments from you? Um, yes, I think um, I'm having difficulty here because my computer keeps dropping out. So I'm afraid I'm not hearing everything that people are saying. But I certainly want to echo what, what Gracie said. Um, it's been a useful discussion. Um, I'm always a little bit wary about discussions that are too academic because I think they're by default exclusive. And I was struggling with some of the questions, I think, uh, so they were so multidimensional and so complex and required quite a lot of deep thought and, and, and preparation. But um, I suppose if I had come up with any parting comment, it would simply be that we need to stop thinking that we have all the answers in Europe. Um, poor and the disp dispossessed of this world have a voice um, and it needs to be listened to. And we need to really guard against reproducing the same kind of patronizing power dynamics that have always existed Otherwise, nothing will change. Um, I know um, from my own recent experience of being in, involved in, in, in resourcing racial justice um, funding debates, that there's a huge amount of activity around the country. Many, many groups, as, as, as Gracie said, who are doing really important work. And I suppose my plea would be for that work to be joined up. Um, we are load and it's really important that we begin to join the dots um, because as I said right at the beginning of this discussion I think the most important strength that we have unity our ability to overcome our difference and to um, focus on our commonalities thank you so much um, thank you to all of our panelists panelists for your um, your thoughts your discussion uh, your generosity uh, to sit here and think and chat together. Thank you to every single person watching um, for giving us your Wednesday evening. Um, really, really grateful that everybody was here and having these discussions. Again, I apologize that we couldn't get to everyone's questions. Um, to those who are loving this series, there is one left um, on 23rd of September, Imagining New Worlds.
uh, please do book for that. That is on Eventbrite. If you need to find the link for the Eventbrite, um, you can go, I think, to the Verso website and Twitter and to the Decrim Futures website, which is Decriminalized Futures, all as one word, dot org. Um, and once again, this has been recorded. We will send out a recording of this session um, and we'll send also a list of those resources, those groups, books, articles that have been mentioned by our speakers throughout the event. So that if you want to dig a little bit deeper, learn more about this or get involved in some of the organisations and campaigns that are doing this work day to day, that you can. Um, and once again, just to remind everybody that there is a 50% Verso discount on both Stella and Nadine's books. Um, which the code should have come up for you a few times on the screen. So make uh, make the best of that. And yeah, thank you all so, so much uh, for spending your evening with us. It was a really brilliant discussion. I learned a huge amount um, and I'm really grateful to all of our speakers. And of course, those who we can't see, all of the tech and organisers who have made this session and all of the other sessions in this series happen. So thank you all so much and have a lovely rest of your Wednesday night.